good morning still. Um, in North Carolina, uh, the time is 11.24, so I'm a little earlier than the noon time that I was uh, projecting to go on, but we have to go to the grocery store and got stuff running around to do. It's not my own time frame, so I'm definitely trying to make sure I make time. So I hope you have a wonderful happy 4th of July, and we're going to go ahead and get into the Word this morning. We're in 2 Kings 23, and we'll go ahead and open in prayer. Lord, I just thank you for this day, and I thank you for your word, and I thank you that your word is new every morning, and I thank you that we can meet together, and we can get into your word and share it with each other, and learn and grow in who you have called us to be, and Lord, I just ask that you would bless this time in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are in 2 Kings 23, 31, Jehoahaz, Jehoahaz's reign and captivity. So Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done, and Pharaoh Necho put him in bonds at Riblah in the land of Hamath that he might not reign in Jerusalem and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And Pharaoh Necho made Elikim, the son of Josiah king, in the place of Josiah his father and changed his name to Jehoiakim. Okay, but he took Jehoaz away and he came to Egypt and died there. Wow. And Jeho Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh. But he taxed the land to give the money according to the command of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land and everyone according to his assessment to give it to Pharaoh Necho. So we see Jehoiakim is taken out of his seat as king. He was evil in the sight of the Lord. His son becomes king. His son's is, name is changed by Pharaoh Necho and Pharaoh Necho uh, has him giving him all the money from the land. So Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim is now in place. So Jehoiakim reigns in Judah. So that was in Israel, right? Jerusalem, Judah, evil in the sight of the Lord. Oh no, that was in Judah too. Okay, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebida, the daughter of Padiah of Rumah. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. You know, when we think our sin is isolated and we think it only affects us, it's something that we pass on from generation to generation because we do what we do. And if it's evil in the sight of the Lord, it's something that continues on to, our, to the next generation. So we need to be very careful of the things that are passing on to the next generation, right? So in these days, Nebuchadnezzar, in these days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him, and the Lord sent against him bands of Chaldeans, and bands of Syrians, and bands of Moabites, and bands of Ammonites, and sent them against Judah to destroy it. According to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servants, the prophets. Why? Because they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Right? Surely this came upon Judah at the command of the Lord to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also for the innocent blood that he had shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not pardon the Lord could pardon, but the Lord would not pardon. And we wouldn't we wouldn't want a God that would pardon bloodshed, right? I mean, we when we see someone that is evil and doing wrong, we want them to suffer and be punished. And it's not okay that they do it. Well, that's exactly what God thinks, and God wasn't gonna pardon his sin, right? So now the rest of the deeds of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And so Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, and Jehoiakim, his son, Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, and Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come again out of his land. For the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt, and the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. 
Um, good morning, Sheila. Glad that you're watching. So Jehoiachin reigns in Judah. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. Sorry, alarm went off. So he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father has done. Again, we see the evil of a father passing down to the next generation. Jerusalem is captured. So verse 10, at that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon himself and his mother and his servants and his officials and his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made. It's just so sad how something that could have been avoided by following after what God had for them, they're his best, but choosing to do our own will, which is never going to work out, caused all of this destruction. And all of this is as the Lord had foretold. So he carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen on all the smiths. None remain except the poorest people of the land. And he carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon. And the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon all the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen and the metal workers, 1,000, all of them strong and fit for war. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Good morning, Anthony. Glad that you're watching. Thanks for the likes. Um, so we see that there is now a shift in power. Babylon has taken over. Babylon has taken all of the people of God and it's all in God's will. Why would God allow this? Because they were not right with God. And God takes us to the point of brokenness to bring us back to where he needs us to be. Focused on him, calling out to him, worshiping him, seeing who he is and wanting to glorify him in the midst of the trial, right? Because sometimes that's what it takes for us to readjust our focus to who God really is in our lives, right? Getting ourselves out of the way and putting God in control. Good morning, Anthony. Glad that you're here. So here we go. They're over here now. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is taken over. So Zedekiah reigns in Judah. Zedekiah was, oh, and did you catch that? Nebuchadnezzar only took those people who in the eyes of the world were worth something, right? The rich, the mighty, the the ones that had um, talent. And, and he left the poorest people of the land. The poorest people of the land remained free. Do you see how the first become last and the last become first? I, I don't know about you, but I would rather be the poorest people in the land and be able to be free rather than go into captivity. And see, that's how God's provision and God protects those that he loves. He knew that the reason that um, the people were in this situation was because of those that were in power. And those that, empow that were in power were taken away. And those that had nothing but to call out to God more than likely had the hearts right for God because they had to depend on God for each and everything. But then when all was taken away and everyone left, guess what? They were left with everything. And that's how God provides. God provides for those that are calling out and depend on him. So here we go. We see Zedekiah reigning in Judah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So even though they're carried away into captivity, even though they have nothing, they still will not call out to God. They will not break the spirit of rebellion within themselves, right? According to all that Jehoiakim had done, for because of the anger of the Lord, it came to the point in Jerusalem and Judah that he cast them out 
of his presence. I don't know about you, but I do not want to be cast out of the presence of God. Because there is no peace, there is no hope, there is no love, there is no light outside of the presence of God, right? So Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. And you might think, well, then that's good. Well, no, no, it's not. Because God had sent the king of Babylon there to break down the rebellion in his people. And him rebelling against the king of Babylon was him rebelling against the will of God. And we might think, well, that's ridiculous. Well, you know, what's foolish in his man is wisdom to God. So here we go, fallen captivity of Judah. And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. <coughs> oh, coffee hit me. <laughs> and they built siege works all around it. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Why is there famine? Well, there's nobody to work the land. They're, they're under attack. They can't do their crops. So now there's no food. There's no food, and they're under attack, and God is, is they, they're being cast out of the presence of God. But wouldn't you call out to God at this point? Well, let's see. Then a breach was made in the city, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls by the king's garden. And though the Chaldeans were all around the city, they went in the direction of Arabah, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king. Oh, happy fourth. Tell Jimmy I said hi. Oh, I'm in, actually, I'm in um, North Carolina. So give Jimmy a text. He would love to hear from you, Anthony. Um... So then they, uh, so the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. And then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon and Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. And they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar. King of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard or servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down and all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls all around Jerusalem. And the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted the king of Babylon together with the rest of the multitude, Nebuzaradan and the, capt the captain of the guard carried into exile. But here you go. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. So the poorest of the land were not carried into captivity. The poorest of the land were allowed to work the vineyards and work the plow and be free and to provide for themselves, their family and the kingdom, but not to be under the thumb of the king. And that's how God works. God protects and God provides, right? And the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord and the stands and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke to pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the dishes for incense and all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service, and the fire pans also, and the bowls, what was of gold, the captain of the guard took away as gold, and what was of silver as silver. As for the two pillars, the one sea, and the stands that Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all these vessels was beyond weight. You couldn't measure how much this stuff weighed because it was so heavy. In, in so rich in what it was, right? The height of the capital was three cubits. A lattice work and pomegranates, all of bronze, were all around the capital. And the second pillar had the same and the lattice work, with the lattice work. And the captain of the guard took Sariah, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the threshold. And from the city, he took an officer who had been in command and the secretary, the commander of the army, who mustered the people of the land, and sixty men of the people of the land who were found in the city. And Nebuzard and the captain of the guard took them, brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile 
out of its land. It seems like just yesterday that God brought them to this promised land, that God gave them this place that he was wanting to promise to them as their own. And all they had to do was take possession of the land and drive out its inhabitants, and God was going before them, and God was going to protect them. But they lost purpose, and they lost vision, and they allowed those that were of the of those that that lived there to stay and they uh, they started worshiping their gods and they lost their their vision and their fervor and their desire to worship god and because of that now they're being carried into exile out of the promised land so now we see Gedaliah made governor of judah and over the people who remained in the land of judah whom nebuchadnezzar king of babylon had left he appointed Gedaliah the son of ahiakim the son of shaphnon the governor Now when all the captains and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah governor, they came with their men to Gedaliah at Mizpah, namely Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and Johanan, the son of Korea, and Sariah, the son of Tahmeth, the Netophathite, and Jezanian, the son of the Machathite, and Gedaliah swore to them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid because of the Chaldeans' officials. Live in the land, serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. But in the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Nathanian, son of Elishmia, uh, too short, woke up six and couldn't go back to sleep. How are you celebrating today? Oh, that was Scar Melinda. She doesn't realize I'm live. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so then, okay, so Dahlia put them, okay, here we go. Okay, verse 25. But in the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Nathanian, son of Elishmia, of the royal family came with ten men and struck down Gedaliah and put him to death along with the Jews and the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. Then all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the forces arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. So the people are still resisting, still resisting the captivity that they're in, thinking that they're fighting for their freedom, and really what they're doing is they're fighting against the will of God. They are where they are at because they are wrong with God, because they are doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord has placed them there to learn something, and they are rejecting it. So now we're in verse 27. Jehoiachin released from prison. And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month of the 27th day of the month, evil, this is his name, are you kidding me? Evil Morodach king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin put off his prison garments, and every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king according to his daily needs as long as he lived. And his, the king's name that did that was Evil Morodok. Who who can who can make up something like that? <laughs> that's God, right? Okay, so we see that's where we're gonna leave our Old Testament reading. Jehoiachin is being provided for by Evil Morodok, and um, Israel is fighting the captivity that, that it's in. And now we're gonna go into our New Testament reading in Acts twenty two seventeen. So when I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance. Now this is Paul. And saw him saying to me, make haste and go out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So Paul is giving, given a vision that he is not to be there to witness to the Jews any longer. He is to go out. He is to go to the Gentiles, those that are not the people of God. He is to go to them and spread, Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, and give them the gospel message. And so Paul is now, Paul in the Roman Tribune is up next in verse 22. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. They're rejecting not Paul, but the word of God, right? 
And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? See, Paul is not stupid. Paul knew the law. Paul knew that God was in control and he was in this situation, not at their hand, but at God's will. And he wasn't about to let himself be flogged for something that was not his, his fault and that he was going to stand on what is right. And I think that's the same thing we should do. If we are right in, in doing what is right, we should not fall over and just let others walk all over us. He shows that we should not be a doormat, but we should stand firm in who and what God is. So here we go. We see, um, should you do this? And when the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said, what are you about to do? This man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune answered, I, brought, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. So the tribune had to buy his citizenship. So the tribune answered, I bought the citizenship. But Paul says, I am a citizen by birth. Now that's completely different. Someone who buys their citizenship is not equal to someone who is born a citizen. And now here they go. So those who are about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him, which is against the law which was could get them in big trouble. So Paul was in the right and Paul stood up for what was right and God stood beside him. And that's the God we serve. So Paul before the council, but on the next day, desiring to know the, re the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience. Up to this day, and the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to law you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your own people. So, Paul said that to the high priest, not knowing he was the high priest. And then when he's told he is the high priest, Paul takes a step back and quotes the law that he is not okay to talk back against authority. Now, this is a true man of God and shows how he honors who God is. He is standing for what is right, but he's not going against God's word. And that's what we also need to do. So now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out to the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. His words are meant to bring division. Why? Because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. Uh -huh. Um. So that caused the Sadducees to be against the standing of the Pharisees who did believe in the resurrection. And when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose and some of the scribes of the Pharisees party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. Because God is always in control. And God's word is meant to cause division and meant to cause you to have to take a stand. You're going to have to stand for what is right or to submit to what is wrong. You're going to have to stand for what you believe. And everyone will stand and take account for what they believe, for what you do with the name of Jesus Christ, right? So that's where we're going to leave Paul. Paul is now in the barracks uh, awaiting whatever is going to happen from this situation. So now we're in Psalms 2. Psalms 2, the reign of the Lord's anointed. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in, with his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with an, a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. We are blessed when we take refuge in the Lord our God. And we're gonna end with our Proverbs reading, Proverbs 18, 13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. We are quick to say something and not really understand what the whole topic is about. And we need to listen, be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry, right? Listen to what others have to say because they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Care about people, show God's love, be a good example, respect authority, but stand for what is right. I pray that you, and I think that's perfect in accordance with our Independence Day today, that our forefathers stood for what was right and believed that God was in control and that God had a plan and a purpose for us. Thank you, Jackie, for joining in. I'm sorry I had to start early this morning. Um, so I'm getting finished right now. We have to go to the store and, you know, family stuff for the 4th of July. So I hope you have a great 4th of July. Um, stand for God. Stand for what's right. Believe that he is in control and that he can do all things. I pray that you have a very blessed day. Thank you, God, for our Independence Day. Thank you, God, for a free country that we can share the Word of God in. And I pray that you have a blessed day with family and friends and that um, you can show God your love. Go show others God's love. God bless.